everybody, and thank you for joining us. I'm Todd Shaw. I am president of this organization, Save the Great South Bay. Um, we, uh, we do a number of things, which includes uh, our Creek Defender Program, uh, where we defend the 50 creeks that flow into the Great South Bay. Uh, and the 16 towns, uh, we're putting in a, um, a creek defender in every single one of those towns to defend those 50 creeks. Um, we are also doing um, uh, wonderful things with our oyster growers. We're advocates of aquaculture. But today we're here to talk about Bay Friendly Yards, which is our, uh, uh, our third and really um, probably the one that has, besides for the Creek Defender Program, probably one, some of the most momentum out of any of the programs that we have. Um, so uh, I'm also wishing, obviously, that everybody out there is safe, you're healthy, uh, our prayers and thoughts go out to the people that are sick and, uh, and maybe some people that have lost some loved ones. Um, I, uh, I'll kick off the program by saying that, um, you know, we're a 501c3 organization um, whose mission is to protect and preserve Long Island's Great South, Great South Bay for future generations to enjoy. Our efforts go far beyond our organization and reach deep into the local communities. Uh, I would like to thank, before we get started, all of our all of our amazing, generous sponsors, York Analytical Laboratories, uh, the Lessings Hospitality Group, our prayers go out to those guys, the amazing sponsors. You know, they've obviously been down for a very long time and hopefully they can get up and, um, and back to business soon. Um, and uh, and Blue Point, uh, the brewery, uh, who has been uh, a tremendous sponsor of ours as well. Um, uh, we're currently in uncharted waters due to the COVID, right? The importance of the health of the Great South Bay has not changed though. And nitrogen overload, stormwater runoff, and education, and the reduction of native wildlife and plant habitats are just some of the factors that have de uh, degraded the health of the bay. And as we say, the bay is, is but a symptom. Uh, it is the mainland that's really sick. Having a bay-friendly yard is one way you can participate individually in our efforts to protect the bay whilst having a beautiful yard. Uh, it actually enhances the beauty of what you look at every single day because it brings in so much nature and wildlife. Um, and what I'd like to turn, um, uh, uh, I believe that's right. And, and, what, and, and with that, what I would like to do now is just turn the mic over to Robin Silvestri. Robin is our Executive Director of Save the Great South Bay and today's program moderator. Thanks for joining us today. I look forward to seeing the results of all of our great work that we do. Thanks, Todd. Thanks. And again, we welcome everybody who is joining in now to our um, first ever virtual speaker series, Bay Friendly Yards, A Cure for the Common Lawn. We're here today with um, three of our guest speakers, uh, Frank Piccinini, from, uh, director at Save the Great South Bay and uh, chair of our Upland Habitat Restoration Committee. We have Steve Young from SUNY ESF joining us in today, and Anthony Marinello, a native planting expert from Long Island recently featured in Newsday. So I also would like to thank our sponsors because without their support, we cannot do the programs that we do and advocate for the health of the Great South Bay. Um, as Todd, Todd touched upon, there are many factors that affect uh, the state of our Great South Bay. And to frame today's discussion, I think we need to look back to uh, about 60 years ago to when our Long Island started to be developed by Levitt. Uh, Long Island became the poster child for the suburban community. You know, uh, individual lots with the uh, white picket fences and these beautiful green lawns. Um, they became, the manicured lawns became a symbol of success and uh, status. So today, unfortunately, we're seeing the results of those, um, of those times and our bay is suffering under nitrogen laden waters, um, nitrogen overload from thousands of hundreds of thousands of updated septic tanks, uh, to storm water runoff that's filled with nitrogen and fertilizers and destructive pesticides. So large scale land clearing has also led to a uh, dramatic decrease in native habitat, which is what we're here to talk about today and how we, we can restore that habitat that is so fundamental to the birds and the bugs and the wildlife that we need to continue our life cycle here. Native habitat also plays a key role in filtering our groundwater. So I would like to welcome um, Frank yeah, and Anthony, as we get started today on our, um, on our discussion. And uh, thank you so much, guys, for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Yeah. 
I'd, so I'd like to kick it off, uh, Frank, if you could, with um, what is a Bay Friendly Yard? What does it mean and why are they so important? Yeah, so, so Bay Friendly Yards is Save the Great South Bay's, uh, one of our, our lead programs here. And, and we're really just kind of getting it off the ground. Although we've had our ebook published for some time, uh, we're really trying to introduce some rigor into what it means to be a Bay Friendly Yard. So we have um, a Bay Friendly certification process that we're starting with. Um, and there's really three prongs that your yard would have to meet in order to be uh, certified as a Bay Friendly Yard here. In the, uh, the South Shore of Long Island. So the first thing is habitat restoration. So what does that mean? Habitat restoration means different things in different places. It could be just a small patch of uh, native wildflowers to, to feed some uh, pollinators. It could be uh, some, a, grove of, a grove of trees. Uh, it really just, it's, it's different things in different places. And that's, that's the first uh, aspect of it is habitat restoration. Um, the second aspect is stormwater management. Um, and all the good things that you do as far as habitat restoration will also help with stormwater management. So if you have a healthy, thriving tract of forest, and, and what I mean by tract, like it could be just as small as a 10 by 10 plot, um, that, that does a, a number of things from a stormwater standpoint. Um, trees can act as almost a straw where you, you stick it in the ground and it creates this process called evapotranspiration, lowering stormwater, uh, lowering the groundwater table and buffering stormwater runoff. Uh, but there's also other uh, more obvious examples of stormwater management, such as the, the use of rain barrels and the use of uh, and the creation of rain gardens. Um, and the third arm of our uh, Bay Friendly Yards program is local stewardship. Bay Friendly, we don't like to call it maintenance so much. It's more about stewardship. Um, and again, it means different things in different places. And it's, it's really uh, homeowner uh, preference can drive it. Uh, but certainly things like no fertilizer use, um, leaving the leaves every fall, and if, even if you, don't, if you don't want them scattered throughout your lawn, putting them in your bed, um, using mulching mowers, and so on. Just doing, maintaining your yard uh, in a way that you're actually contributing to the health of the Great South Bay, as opposed to further degrading it. So that's, that's an overview of our program, and you know, I, I, here on, we, we have some awesome panelists, and I'd love to kind of uh, get them involved and, and ask some more specific questions about their experience. So Robin, please. Hey, great, thanks. So um, when we talk about restoring habitat, Steve, across, the, um, across Long Island, um, I read recently a book by Douglas Talame, Nature's Best Hope, and he talks about creating little patchworks that connect into a quilt of bay-friendly, um, so native landscaping. Can you tell us, you know, what is the scope of what we're looking really to accomplish <laughs> in a non-philosophical way <laughs> of, uh, with, with the, such a, with habitat restoration. I think habitat restoration is really important because of the, the disturbance that we've had over the years of our uh, native ecosystems. And so I think we're trying to restore our native ecosystems to uh, provide native plants for our, our native wildlife and our native insects, especially. I think if you read, read Doug Callamy's book, you know that he advocates native plants because of all the food that they provide for our native insects, which provide food for our native birds and other wildlife. And also to establish native plant corridors for wildlife to travel around the island and, um, and open those areas up for that. Thank you. Anthony, what's been your experience in, the, in your yard transformation with the, um, the, ch the change in wildlife that you've seen after having planted, uh, you know, restored your habitat on the front lawn? A very big difference. Um, even if you, you can even observe it if you look at my yard and look at the neighbor's yard directly next door, mm -hmm. um, especially in the summer months and everything's blooming. You have insects everywhere. There's, the wings are shimmering in the sunlight, butterflies on the blooms. Um, songbirds in the trees nesting in the bushes. It's it's really quite a difference. Um, and I'm not the only one who notices. So like the whole neighborhood notices this. It's something that really draws people in and it's something that's lacking. And to what Steve said, um, if we could even just get Long Islanders to, to just put aside their front lawns, which most people don't use on a regular basis, if at all, that would create so much habitat and so much stormwater collection that it would really make a very big difference for the health of the land and the bay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Could you give us, um, uh, you know, for some people who may not be 
um, so informed on the topic, the difference between native, exotic, and invasive? Sure. All right. So a native species, this is between animals, plants, and you know everything, not just plants. Um, for the, the definition for North America would be anything that was here growing naturally before Columbus set foot and brought things from Europe and Asia with him. Um, an exotic plant at that point is anything that came from other lands, not native here, including a different region on North, in North America. It could be, an ex you can consider an exotic plant to New York or Long Island. An invasive plant at that point is an exotic plant out of its natural range that can then reproduce away from human cultivation and displace native plants and cause disruption within the ecosystem. Great. Um, Steve, could you give us some example of invasive plants? I know you had your uh, a, a pretty good webinar this morning on <laughs> the topic. Yeah, Long Island has, has a good uh, assortment of invasive plants, so mm -hmm. you don't have to go too far to find them on Long Island, but um, even on the beaches, uh, you know, you usually don't think of the beaches as, as full of invasive plants. They're mostly native, but there are some things like um, there's a uh, sedge, Carex kobomuji, the uh, Asian, Asiatic sand sedge, which is starting to take over some parts of the of Queens and uh, the Rockaways and uh, Staten Island too. But um, if you go to the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area website, you can find a good list of invasive species there. Also, uh, the New York Flora Association has an atlas. If you look up the New York Flora Atlas mm -hmm. online, uh, you can download lists of species for your county and they'll tell you which ones are native and non-native. Gotcha. So Frank, can you um, speak to the, um, how do you assess your yard specifically? You know, you have a yard, I have a lot of sun, some people have a, a live on the coast. Um, how do you determine what are the proper plants or the best plants suited to a, an area? Yeah, yeah. So it can get very overwhelming very quickly. I mean, there's a lot of resources out there, a lot of databases and, and plant lists that you know have a lot of different plant characters characterizations. Um, really, but the big thing that that you should do and, and keep in mind is that one, you don't have to tackle the whole thing at once. Um, it, it can get very overwhelming. Um, but once you decide to tackle something, first assess what's there. Um, to figure out which invasives you have, learn how to control them best because each individual plant has their own ecological character characteristics that uh, will lead to their control or not. Um, so for example, uh, English ivy, uh, it's pretty easy to clip it at the base of a tree and let it kind of melt off. You don't want to yank and pull because it could damage the bark of a tree. Um, whereas something like garlic mustard sort of spreads by wind and it's just all over the place very quickly. Um, and, and you want to really concentrate at first on pulling up the one flowers because that's a two-year life cycle. So focus on limiting the, the seed bank and then over time you can kind of beat it back. Once you uh, figure out what's native, what's not, and what you want to remove and, and how to do that, um, then you really should start looking at uh, actually patterns and processes that are um, inherited to the biota and just the so, so for example, shade is a big thing that drives um, the success or lack thereof for a plant um, mm -hmm. and flooding. So is there any spots of your lawn that gets kind of soggy and uh, over the time? Is there any standing water? Um, and, and those are really the, and then soils, but really that if you're going to key in on anything as far as trying to figure out what to plant where, um, I would focus on shade and flooding regimes. Thank you. Thank you. So I think one a question that some uh, audience members may have is, what, what does it cost to, you know, to turn your lawn over from a patch of green to, um, and what does it look like um, over time from when you start to the end? Can you speak to that, Anthony? Sure. For the most part, you have to consider the fact that most people to pay for a landscaping service to maintain their lawns are already spending about a thousand to two thousand dollars a year on just maintenance to just mow their lawn without doing cleanups and such. So when you consider that and you go to plan your native garden or you go to plan a bay friendly yard and you remove your lawn or reduce it as much as you can, it's gonna cost it's gonna have a higher cost up front than you would expect, but you're gonna save money long term through that lack that lack of need of maintenance. 
So it's not that it doesn't need maintenance, but it doesn't need the same kind of maintenance. And it doesn't require maintenance that you're going to be spending money that for to bring applications in and to be putting inputs constantly into the garden. And you're actually be using what's already available in the garden to maintain it. So you're saving money in the long run. Mm -hmm. So I think that brings us to the, um, the all important question of fertilizer. And I'm going to ask all three of you to give us your perspective on fertilizers, organic fertilizer, no fertilizer, um, just your thoughts on it. You want to start with you, Steve? Well, actually, in my lawn, I don't use any fertilizers. I've never have either. So, um, and there are different, since I'm a botanist, I like different species in my lawn. <laughs> I don't like a monoculture. So, uh, you know, I mow it and the, the wildflowers and the grasses and things I do fine uh, without fertilizer. So uh, I would not recommend any fertilizer actually. Okay, Frank. Yeah, and I can speak from Save the Great South Bay standpoint. Um, and we're sort of echoing Steve's sentiment. Mm -hmm. um, lawns are just this boring, lifeless monoculture, culture, right? And I think it's sort of um, outdated at this point. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't mind that part of my lawn is sort of brown a little bit. I don't mind that part of my lawn is actually just moss now. Um, I actually kind of like it a lot better. And um, you know, I, I do want to bring up one point. Uh, I hear a lot of advertisements, you know, we, we're using organic fertilizer and you know, we're using, uh, the, you know, we're, we're, we're using it within the guidelines. And, and, and yes, there's, there's a responsible way to use fertilizer if you must have a boring fluorescent lawn. Um, but organic fertilizer is still nitrogen based and most of that runs off and ultimately into our waters degrading our, our system. So, you know, I, I very much echo Steve's sentiment and I imagine Anthony is going to have a similar opinion on this. Um, no fertilizer, um, use a mulching mower, uh, leave the leaves, mulch the leaves, you know, let, let nature's fertilizer uh, do the work that it, it should be doing. And, and Anthony, if, I, if there's any le room left for you to diss on fertilizers. Uh, I'm going to pretty much echo both of you said, but um, I'll add a little bit to it. I, especially if you're coming from a, a monoculture lawn that was chemically treated in the past, the only recommendation I would say is to apply a little compost to jumpstart the process of the natural soil bacteria and fungus that should be there that may be lacking because you kind of just killed it over the past decade of treating it like a lawn. Um, besides that, biodiversity, choose plants, whether you have a lawn, you let clover creep in or you're doing native plants um, specifically, you can choose legume species, legume family members such as, you know, Eastern redbud, they, they are nitrogen fixing. You have to choose nitrogen fixing members and that'll fertilize all your plants for you in your garden, whether it's the lawn that you're mowing or it's any other plant in your garden, that'll suck the, new, the, the nitrogen out of the air and put it in the soil where it belongs, how nature intended it to be, and provide it straight to the plants that need it instead of letting it run off every time it rains. And you know, I was amazed. Uh, last few years, I have not raked the leaves on my lawn. I've just mulched them, like you said, Frank. And I was amazed by the end of the winter, you couldn't even tell that there were leaves there. I mean, they right. break right down. Yeah. And I didn't have to rake them. <laughs> Save time right. and money. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hey Steve, could you, could you speak to the, um, the uh, food web and how um, native plants attract or how certain species are attracted to native plants versus to um, exotic or invasive plants? Well, more exotic, I guess, than invasive. Right. Well, native plants have been here a lot longer than the new exotic plants have come, uh, uh, you know, as far as uh, horticulture plants or other things, just hitching rides from other continents. But um, so those, those plants have evolved with their native pollinators and, um, and uh, animals that feed on them for thousands of years. So those native plants support a lot more native fauna uh, than the invasives do. They, they've done a lot of studies that show that these invasive plants or the, the exotics hardly support any of our native flora, uh, fauna. So it's really um, uh, a great thing to, to plant natives to support the ecosystem. What would you say are some of the most affected species here on Long Island? The most affected species? 
um, or like monarch butterflies or a certain bird uh, that we no longer see locally? Right. Uh, well, pollinators in general and also, uh, yeah, the butterflies. And you don't see any of those big moths anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's that windshield test where people growing up, they remember driving around and seeing a lot of insects <laughs> on the windshield. And now when you drive long distances, you don't hardly see any insects on your windshield. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can just tell by that. But, but um, uh, we, we're doing, uh, the New York Natural Heritage Program has a, a five-year pollinator project, which we're in the middle of right now. So we're inventorying different pollinators around the state to get an idea of really what's happening to them with uh, the loss of our native plants. And I have, I have two examples I can give as well. Too. Sure. Um, I know Doug, Douglas telling me his studies showed that um, oak trees and cherry trees, specifically, oak trees can host over 500 different species of moths and butterflies. And, um, and cherry trees, I think it was 300, over 300 species. So um, if you want to do something for songbirds, plant, it's, you, if you have the room for those trees, plant those trees, especially cherry trees, because they'll be feeding both the adult birds with the fruit and the chicks with the insects that are feeding on the foliage. Mm -hmm. yeah, we call those songbird feeders. Like, yeah. you know, it's just like having a bird feeder, except it's oh, a, a better bird feeder. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a good point and it's something that should be um, just sort of echoed here um, with the, our other speakers. The, I think a lot of folks think about pollinator gardens and they're objectively beautiful. Um, just having native flowers that, you know, you see these, these pretty butterflies coming to. But really the, the life cycle that's limiting or, or the, the feature, habitat feature that's limiting is where are the caterpillars living um, that ultimately turn into these butterflies. And, and to Anthony's point, uh, I, I'm pretty sure, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Anthony, the, the National Wildlife Foundation actually has a database. They do, um, yeah, they do. Of, of which species support the most um, caterpillar species. And, and as Anthony said, um, oaks, cherries, beaches, some of these big old trees, um, those are really the, uh, the important ones from, a, from a, a habitat standpoint. And they also, you know, putting aside pollinators, will also support uh, her herpetofauna, so things like you know all other uh, levels of, of fauna too so it's you know it's not just the pollinators it's 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 about uh, instead of biodiversity I always think of it as diversity of interactions and that's really what you want to try to bring into your yard mm -hmm. and they not only support the fauna but also the fungi you know each plant is sure. associated with a fungi mm -hmm. and an animal usually you really can't think of plants as just plants they're always associated with animals and fungi so Okay, terrific. Oh. Um, well, Frank, I guess this is, uh, Anthony, this one of you could possibly add to this question. Sure. Originally meant for Matt Gettinger, who um, unfortunately was unable to join us today um, due to a personal personal um, issue, but uh, I hope he'll get, us, get with us on one of our future ones. But can native plants provide privacy? Of course, of course. Um, there's many different ways to provide privacy. You can either layer the native plants. There's no reason to think that just because a plant's native, it won't provide privacy. Um, many of the most commonly used plants to make privacy screens actually happen to be native plants. Arborvitae is one of them. Um, it's kind of overused in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, white pine is another one, which is one of my favorite trees, which can also be used to, to, for large areas if you really want to block your view. Um, but there's, there's many options for both privacy and beautiful, you know, that are beautiful. I know that's also kind of a stigma that people think native plants and they think wildflowers and they think like a wild mess, but it can be very orderly and it can be very beautiful and ornamental and there could be a lot of curb value yeah. If, yeah. If, if you invest in it. Sorry, Anthony. No problem. Yeah. I was just going to um, also suggest too, I mean, you listed some awesome um, evergreens, but there's even deciduous species that are native that will do well from a screening standpoint too. Um, one that I often recommend is bayberry. Um, it's a it's a beautiful um, beautiful bush. It gets somewhat big, but it, it kind of stays a little bit more compact. And the cool thing about it is that it doesn't really lose its leaves. I have a bayberry planted in my yard for privacy. Um, and and just now, as they're starting to bud out for the spring, they're a little bit of a late butter. Um, it's just now starting to lose its leaves. And similarly, actually behind me in my, my, um, my wallpaper, you can see an American beech tree. Uh, and the American beech actually hold their leaves all, all winter too. Um, and uh, just until 
about two weeks ago, uh, the beech tree behind me, which is now, you know, saying hi for the spring, um, there was you know, very hardy uh, leaves kind of just sitting there on the plant and could be used as privacy. So a little, a little winter interest too with that. Winter, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> right, so um, I just have a question from one of somebody in the audience. What was the agency that was mentioned that has a list of, of species that support pollinators? Yeah, it's National Wildlife Foundation. So it's uh, NF NWF, just right. Um, you know, Federation, Federation. Federation. Say it again. Federation, National Wildlife Federation. Gotcha, so, thank you. Also, and, um, the, the Xerxes Society for Environmental Conservation has a few different. Anthony? The, the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. It's a long one. <laughs> Okay. Um, they're out in California, but they're a national organization that's based, uh, that their whole point is to conserve pollinators and invertebrates. All right. I'll send everyone a link to that uh, on, a, on the follow-up email. Here's a question from Thomas Wilson. I'm expanding my butterfly and moth plantings. Just planted swamp milkweed, which is preferably reported, reportedly preferred by monarchs. What are your thoughts on morning glories? How about moon vines for moths? And do we get Luna and Cercropia moths on Long Island? Uh, it's a it's a pretty uh, pretty uh, big list of questions to answer. Right. You know, so, as, what are your thoughts on morning glories? Well, I mean, I, I would just encourage um, a, a lot of diversity. Uh, I mean, look at Anthony's. I, I think that's your lawn, right, Anthony? Behind yeah, this you. is like a very low angle. I took of a little section of the garden last year, make it it's, look bigger than it is, but. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the important thing is to have um, diversity because again, you get um, diversity of interactions, right? So uh, multiple, uh, multiple species visiting, um, you'll have different times of year where there's, the, where there's different blooms and you know, you wanna, you wanna really, so rather than talk about specific plants and, and, and you guys can do that if you want on, on those specific questions, but uh, I just wanna kind of overemphasize that um, it, for, for one, I mean, you, you should really have things blooming throughout the year to provide uh, some pollen uh, for, for the pollinators uh, and really look to, to do some diverse layering in, in your garden. But if you guys want to handle those the specific questions on those specific plants, please, by all means. So the second one was moon vines for moths. And yeah, I think Steve would be better to answer that. I'm not sure if those are native to, to New York at all or if they support anything that I'm we not want sure to be supporting. Moon vines. I think it's the white morning glories, the white, the white flowering ones. But either way, I don't think morning glory is really native, correct? There are some native ones, um, but yeah, uh, I'm not sure. And do we get lo Luna and Cer Cercropia moths on Long Island? I'm not an entomologist, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> I'd have to I look into it. There are those moths on Long Island, yeah. Okay, great. And certainly in the oh. rest of New York and up in New England, I would think you would get them here. Uh, um, if you're looking for a specific vine, just wrap it up, sorry. Uh, yeah. Coral is a native beautiful um, vine that's not overly aggressive that'll that'll do well in most parts of Long Island so um, you know th that's the common name I think it's Lanicera sempivarens um, you know so coral honeysuckle is my recommendation if you're looking for a flowering vine. Okay Barbara Wildfire said uh, we do get luna moths on Long Island especially out east. Thank you Barbara. Thanks. Um, so I would like to go back to you know uh, and I myself have a standard postage stamp green lawn um, that we're in the process of converting over to some uh, native habitat. And, um, and the question is, um, I guess, can it be beautiful? Does it have to, I, I'm afraid it will look messy. And I think that's something, a sentiment that we hear often. You know, how um, manicured can a, a native plantings look? And is it recommended that they look that way? Can I, yeah. can I start? By all means. Sure, all right. Um, well, you have to also consider, I know a lot of people are used to seeing certain things yeah. for uh, in the suburbs specifically, where um, they're used to seeing plants spread apart, mulched heavily with wood mulch and watered regularly. Um, when you're doing a native garden, that's not the healthiest thing to do for the plants and for the whole thing as a whole, because it's you have to think of it as a system that you're keeping healthy. Um, so mm -hmm. plants like to grow into communities. So if you, it, when, once you get the specific plants that you need for your area and you plan out how you want it to look and how it should grow and how it's going to look long term, and you put those plants in the ground and you give it some time, it'll look perfect. It'll look great. You just have to take the time to know your plants. You have to take the time to know 
not only how they're gonna grow the individual plant, but also how they're gonna reproduce because that could be an issue where you have a plant and you think it's gonna be well behaved, but then maybe it seeds out all over your yard. Mm -hmm. So just there's certain things you can do to protect yourself from that messy situation that you're speaking of where you don't wanna run into that problem. So do as much research as you can if you're doing it on your own. Find somebody who knows what they're doing, who's maybe done it before, who can offer some advice, and, and do it, and, and look for different uh, publications on it because there's a lot out there. There's a lot of information online too about how to do it properly and and how to do it slowly and right. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I would add to that that um, it, it doesn't have to be your whole front yard converted. Um, you know, I, I I love the pictures of Anthony's yard. That's very pretty. Uh, but that it, sometimes it's a hard sell for folks that are interested in or or more used to having um, just turf grass. That's sort of, so. You know, I would even if it's just a little five by five plot. Uh, mm -hmm. If everybody on your block did a five by five plot with swamp, with milkweed, as one of the commenters said, I mean, you'd suddenly have a really robust way station for monarchs. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's really about uh, changing the public perception. But the funny thing is. I'm not sure how much we actually have to change the public's perception. Certainly, there'll be some people who are sort of holdouts. Um, I read some research where um, they had they 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 took about 50 people and they had um, images of houses with different planting scenarios. So zero percent native, just a lawn with a token, um, you know, Japanese maple or something. 50 percent and then 100 percent native scenarios. And they asked all the samples, the the, the participants, which do you prefer? Every one of them said that they prefer the 50 or the 100% um, planting scenario. But the second follow-up question to that was, um, well, do you, th uh, do you think your neighbors would be, uh, would be upset with you if your lawns looked like that? And the overwhelming majority of people answered yes. And this was from one block area. So while everybody seemed to prefer the native planting scenario, they all erroneously assumed that everybody would hate them for it. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's just about, um, it's about education and that's sort of why um, we have our, our Bay from the Yards program to kind of get back to the topic slightly um, and we're having signage and we're really trying to get the message out there by working with folks like Steve and Anthony and, and, and helping people to understand that every little bit helps and every, every piece of your yard um, can really do something wonderful for the environment. Yeah. I liked what you said, Frank, about, uh, I think it was you who said it, maybe it was Steve, who said about planting something that will be throughout the year because you have birds that migrate and so they're looking for a landing spot or you have um, butterflies that are heading you know, south for the winter and they, they're looking for a landing spot and if they can't find it, they, they can get distressed and uh, lead to the you know, reduction in their population. So I thought that was a really good point. Uh, can you tell us, um, where we can best find native plants. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think this is a great spot um, to give Long Island natives, Matt Gettinger, who, who was our original panelist, and certainly um, we weren't, we didn't get a step down by having Steve Young, who was one of the, the state's experts in, in plants. So thanks so much for stepping in, Steve. Uh, Matt Gettinger uh, was, was planned, but couldn't make it, um, but he has a beautiful uh, native plant nursery. Uh, I think it's in Centerport, uh, somewhere east and north of me. I know that, um, and, he, the, and they have beautiful material. Um, but failing that, um, Save the Great Bay is actually um, kind of riffed off of Steve Young's community um, community uh, profiles and actually put together plant bundles um, for different habitat types to make it a little bit easier. Um, and and there, there are also online nurseries that you can kind of get seeds and stuff. And, and, and maybe, Anthony, or Steve, you want to touch on um, some of the online stuff and maybe some of the DEC stuff, uh, respectively, guys, so if you want to jump in there. Sure. Um, I, I have a lot of um, experience with the online nurseries. Um, there's a lot of specialty nurseries that the, a lot of them tend to be centered in the Midwest or, or a little bit, you know, the Great Plains states because a lot of them focus on, on prairie plants. Um, but um, you know, there are a lot of good companies out there. There's also a lot of companies that's, that focus on cultivars or you know other hybrids and stuff like that. So you gotta be careful if you wanna be looking for native plants, bare roots, seeds, whatever, find yourself a quality native plant nursery online. Um, other than that, there's a few local places, there's a few local organizations on the island. Um, Long Island Natives is a great nursery. I know there's, there's Limpy, they sometimes, Long Island Native Plant Initiative, they sometimes have plant sales. The different local Audubon chapters are doing their own plant sales. 
Um, so just kind of look around. It also helps to learn botanical names. Like I said, do a lot of research um, if you can. Learn botanical names, and then you can take that knowledge and shop anywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and Deckard's Nursery in, in Northport is actually a retail location that's carrying them. Uh, one word of caution on the, um, on the online stuff. Uh, make sure you, you're, you know what you're looking at when you get them. And I really want to have Steve weigh on this too. But um, I actually ordered uh, from a nursery in Tennessee, um, Bear Root uh, Virginia Creeper. Um, and it started popping up. And I realized what they sent me was Vinca, uh, which is, you know, Virginia Creeper being the native, Vinca being this periwinkle that you see everywhere that's actually a pretty aggressive invasive. Um, so, you know, I think that was an oops on their part, and I, I, I proceeded to rip up all the vinca that I planted this spring, and I'm going to, I'm calling, shaking my fist at them, but just, you know, to Anthony's point, um, learn the botanical names and, and, and just make sure you know what you're planting as you're planting them. So unlike, you know, buying something from a nursery when you can ask a human, you know, clicking online is a little bit harder, but Steve. Yeah, also, I think you have to look at what they define as native too because a lot of nurseries uh, will say this is a native plant nursery, but their definition or what they, what geographical area they encompass. So there might be a nurse like Limpy uh, just does Long Island plants. There are other nurseries that may say, well, I'm doing native plants from the Northeast or some even from, even out to the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to be, you have, that's a good thing to ask a nursery operator is what, do you, what is your geographical area of native plants? Because mm -hmm. you might be getting something that's not really native to New York. Right. It's just native to Ohio or, you know, some other states around New York. So that's, that's a, another good reason to uh, go to the Flora Atlas and download species lists and you can see what's really native to your, to Long Island or to the county. So Joe Chiarella asked, is a flowering cherry native to Long Island? Well, there, there are cherries, uh, black cherry um, is, is native, Prunus serotina is native to Long Island. Um, the, the flowering cherries that um, I actually have one that it might, that somebody planted before I moved in and my, uh, my wife won't let me rip it out. Um, and, you know, I have to focus on the Norway maples and tree of heaven first if I'm going to destroy anything in my backyard. But um, I, I'm fairly certain that the, the most common, like the weeping cherries and these cherries that you see in most nurseries and like Home Depot, are probably from Japan. Anthony, do, do you have any insight? Yeah, yeah. If the common name flowering cherry is usually used for um, the Japanese species. Um, you know, but that's not to say that our native uh, cherry does not flower. <laughs> it does flower and it has quite a show every spring, uh, both filled with white flowers. So that's also something to consider if you do want a, a cherry tree that, that is ornamental. Yeah, and, and there are a lot of flowering trees that um, that are native to New York that are beautiful. Um, Shadbush or serviceberry um, being a really beautiful uh, flowering tree. Um, Cornus Florida, which is a flowering dogwood, um, is also very uh, beautiful. And you know, there there are a number of species um, that you can kind of switch out for it. And you know, it's funny because you'll see you if you have the non-native stuff and you plant it next to the native stuff. Uh, so, sort of to Anthony's point about bugs and insects and birds visiting his lawn versus, uh, or, you know, habitat versus other people's lawns. I mean, even within a maintained habitat, uh, you know, they'll, the birds will sort of ignore the Japanese maples and the flowering cherries because there's no caterpillars on it. There's nothing that's really so interested in that plant. Um, and, and they'll be jumping all over the, uh, the Cornus Florida, the flowering dogwood that you plant next to it. So, you know, plant native. <laughs> yeah. right, we have a couple more questions from the audience. Uh, Anthony from Eric Linder. Anthony mentioned the Eastern Redbud as a nitrogen fixer, but the Penn State website says while most members of the legume family are able to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, Eastern Redbud, redbud lacks the nodules and bacteria necessary for that process. Well, that's something I actually didn't know. I'll have to look into that myself. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other ones. I grow a bunch of Baptisia, well, wild blue false indigo. Um, we have a native uh, Baptisia tinctoria is, is native to Long Island. That's a yellow false indigo. Um, so the options are limited, even if that one happens not to specifically be a nitrogen fixer, but most of the nitrogen fixer, ni most of the legume family members are nitrogen fixers. Yeah, and, and, and uh, you know, it, it's not so important. I mean, the nitrogen fixation is, is great. I mean, you could just put fl uh, clover in your lawn and, and those are legumes that are nitrogen fixing. Uh, but really, if, if you want uh, nutrients to kind of build up in your lawn, just leave the leaves, even if you mulch them. Um, it, it contributes to this process called uh, vertical soil accretion. 
so basically the soil column builds over time uh, and that that you know the soil will become more and more healthy over time that you know so if you plant the right things um, you know you can add mulch to get it started um, or or compost to get it started but really the the, the trees if you, if you plant the right things that they'll sort of improve the habitat that they're living on um, so you know don't get so hung up over um, you know what's what's fixing and what what's mm -hmm. not it's 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 really just about um, you know packing your your yard full of native species and, and letting letting nature do her thing Thank you. So to, to that extent too, if I, if I may, um, you could like, I can actually take a handful of soil from my garden and compare it to the neighbor's garden. And my soil is so much darker and richer and is always more moist compared to the dry, sandy, silty soil of the neighbors. And um, that's because my garden and my lawn, the little bit of lawn there is, is acting as a carbon sink where other people are constantly removing, uh, you know, they're constantly removing the debris, they're constantly Baking it up, shipping it to the dump, you know, doing whatever. Anything that grows in my garden gets chopped down and mulched in to the point, and it's constantly building soil. And there's, you can actually see from the from where I started with the lawn, there's a few inches higher now where the garden beds actually is because there's just been years and years of soil building happening. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's another way, just to just mulch, mulch every every bit of organic matter you can, just mulch it in and just let nature do its thing. And a lot of a lot of native insects live, the, uh, you know, over winter in that mulch too. It's very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and I was just going to add, um, you know, just to bring it back to the bay. Um, the Great South Bay is is really the reason why we're on this webinar anyway today. Um, and and what Anthony is describing that that moist um, soil. I mean, that's very poor soil. So it's basically he he's making his lawn into a sponge. Um, so that so that's maintaining that's holding on to that storm water on his land, um, whereas you know his neighbor's land that you know, very compacted um, soil. Although you know people think of lawn as permeable and a stormwater uh, catch, uh, the truth of the matter is uh, on the continuum from uh, concrete to native forest, lawn is much closer to concrete than native forest. So. You know, just to bring it back to the bay, you can create habitat, make things beautiful, um, and you're and you're also simultaneously. I'm sorry, I just got a call on my phone. Uh, you're simultaneously um, retaining that stormwater on site and helping uh, lead to the health of the Great South Bay and whatever water receiving bodies is around. Yeah, so I'm just going to loop that back. Uh, the three elements of our Bay Friendly Yards program are stormwater management. Uh, habitat restoration, and then eco-friendly maintenance, which I think we've mentioned a couple of the elements here, the, you, you know, re, um, reusing your leaves as mulch, um, using hand mowers instead of gas powered, um, collecting the rainwater for, for uh, stormwater runoff, I mean, uh, rainwater as um, to, um, to irrigate your lawns. Um, there's a couple more questions here from participants I'd like to get to. We can, I think, get to them pretty quick. Or skip Laurel's native. Are, are Laurel's native? Skip Laurel's. This is, this is the problem with common names. I mean, um, you know, you, you can literally call it anything and that name is valid. Um, you know, so uh, do you guys know what species? That, I mean, Steve, maybe skip Laurel? M mountain Laurels are native, I think. But I, skip laurel, I don't think skip laurels are native. The laurel family is a large family, and that's the problem with not knowing the botanical name is because a, a botanical family can exist in North America and exists all the way through Eurasia. So you really need to know the botanical name, both the genus and the species. I haven't heard that name referred to a native plant, so okay. probably not. Right. It's a very common name. A lot of people like to just put it up for privacy because they grow really big. I know that. They'll just say, oh, just throw up some skip laurels. It'll be fine in a, in a couple of years. But I think it's an, I don't think it's a native species. Thank you. Um, two, about species control. How would you recommend controlling tree of heaven and or cutting back uh, Joe Pieweed? Uh, so, so tree of heaven, I actually have that you know, beast of a plant in my backyard. I, I inherited it. Um, and, and, it's, and, and maybe Anthony or Steve, you can kind of talk about Joe Pieweed so we can kind of make it a little more equitable. Uh, but tree of heaven is, a, is, a, is an awful beast of a tree. First of all, it stinks and I don't think it looks very pretty. 
like literally smells, but um, also it's the favorite host plant of the spotted lantern fly, which um, I, I don't believe is here yet, but could be here. So um, a lot of people um, will, will recommend um, herbicides uh, for Tree of Heaven. I don't. Um, what I did I'm in my backyard, and it's sort of experimental, um, I guess. It's literally experimenting in my backyard. Is I, I girdled the plant. Um, so basically, under the bark is like the circulatory system, the xylem and phloem um, of the plant. So if you can kind of just chop into that all the way around the tree, it's sort of a brutal process, but you're, you're starving the roots over time. You know, it can't, the, the leaves can't send any energy back down to the roots because the, it's, it's um, you know, there, there's that break in it. Um, it'll start sending up suckers and you just got to be tenacious and keep clipping it off and starve the roots over time. Um, and I don't recommend herbicides, although um, if you look at some of the native plant forms, that you know they'll they'll jump to glyphos, uh, whatever Roundup um, the chemical is. But don't do that. Starve the roots is my recommendation. But um, in terms of Joe Pieweed, I you know I don't, I don't have anything specific to add. Steve, do you want to answer? Or do you want, should I go? Yeah, go ahead. I don't remember the question. Oh, the, the Joe Pieweed, I, I'm I'm fairly certain they're referring to just the fact that Joe Pieweed gets so large and it tends to flop over. Oh. Um, for that, in a garden setting, they recommend to uh, around the 4th of July is generally the rule of thumb to chop back by about two thirds of the plant. So if you just go in with head shears and just cut the plant back, mm -hmm. that way it'll bush out. And pretty much what you're doing with that is you're simulating deer brows or any other herb, you know, herbivore coming in and grazing on the plant. So some of our native plants require that. Other, um, you know, so that also goes into researching the plant and knowing are, are you going to get a plant that's going to grow to 10 feet tall, like some Joe Pie weeds, or are you going to get a plant that maybe maybe you will choose a cultivar depending on your your feelings about cultivars. You'll go with little Joe Pie weed that'll stay nice and short and behaved. But if not, you can always cut back, and that way it'll push out and you'll get a, a lot shorter plant. You'll get a bloom time a little bit delayed, but you won't have that flop over problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, we have a question from Veronica. Is the commercial mulch that you find at nurseries and big box stores harmful? It can be. The dye, it depends on what it's made out of. The dyes are really the problem that you want to stay away from. If you can get an organic one that's undyed, that's best. Mm -hmm. um, I actually recommend if you're doing like a prairie planting to use straw, seed-free straw. I think straw is the one that's seed-free. Hay has seeds, but uh, if you could get yourself a bale of straw, that's best because that's a grass and that'll smother the weeds in the meantime while your plants establish. For woodland settings, um, like Frank, Frank likes to do woodland plantings and, and the, in that case you can use wood chips, but try to get one that's not dyed. Yeah, and, and I would add, um, just, just mulch is, uh, it, in, in the applications I do um, professionally on, on jobs and, or in my backyard, um, I really only use mulch the first year um, to get the plants established. Um, you have to do some selective editing um, you know, knowing what the, the, you know, this is bittersweet and invasive and this is, you know, stuff we don't want. Um, but, but once the, the plants really get established, um, they, they do really well, um, kind of mulching themselves. They become really their own mulch. Yeah. Yeah. You, you really don't need to mulch after the first year. If you did it right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so Steve, here's a question for you. What do you recommend to prepare for climate change with respect to native species? Oh boy, well, um, some people are actually moving plants from the south to the north um, and assisting them. It's called assisted migration. But um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know uh, if Long Island will really change that much. Uh, in you know the next 10 or 20 years as far as what you would want to plant um do you have anybody else yeah, we're kind yeah, of on yeah. a middle ground between regions to begin with between the mid-atlantic and new england so i think we're kind of already have a lot of those plants that are a little south of us um like i know the redbud specifically isn't really native here but it's a little uh west and south but so that's something but i know a lot of people are doing that where they're saying let's get some plants that are a little so not exactly native to our region, but just a little bit south and help them up. My personal opinion, go with ecotype plants, get plants that are native to this region as much as you can, because they have the genes that have, you know, they've survived millions of years already here. They have the genes, the more genetic diversity you have, the more likely they, they will be resilient and your plants will, you know, take anything that nature can throw at them. Yeah. And even though winter is maybe getting a little warmer, I think, uh, 
you always have those big deep freezes every once in a while that would probably knock something like that back. Unless yeah. This is this is not exactly what the uh, the question was, but um, as far as what I would recommend um, as far as plants in, in, in the face of climate change is plant more um, and more and more often. And, you know, so it can help adapt to climate change. Right. We're buffering stormwater. We're, we're creating habitat. Um, you know, we're, we're increasing that soil porosity, the sponginess of the soil. Um, so, you know, as climate, continue, uh, climate change continues to progress, they expect more frequent and intense storm systems. So the more um, bay-friendly yards we have across South Shore, Long Island, and, and beyond, um, the more adapted we will be for climate change. And at the same time, um, and I think Anthony mentioned carbon sequestration, right? Um, so, I think, you know, so, so we're, we're adapting by planting, but we're also mitigating climate change by um, planting stuff where, you know, uh, I, I think I read somewhere, and, and don't quote me on this exact um, statistic, uh, but one full-grown tree, of course, depending on the species, uh, makes up for the average carbon emissions for um, uh, the average person on Long Island uh, or, you know, beyond. So, you know, plant stuff, adapt and mitigate climate change at the, at the same with one action. Also, I want to say, too, with that extent, um, the plants that we're planting, you, you only see a part of them a lot of their existence is underground and those roots are going deep. They're going like multiple, you know, 20, 30 feet deep. And they actually store a lot of carbon themselves besides in the soil. And then yearly, though, a lot of their roots, they die back every year. And that gets released into the soil and stored in the soil. So that's another thing. Your plants are actively sequestering carbon besides, you know, you coming in and then chopping everything down. But the plants are doing it on their own already. Good point. Good point. So here's from Eric Linda. Uh, Linda, I live in Flower Hill, which has many non-oak trees over 70 feet tall and likely over 70 years old uh, and are getting towards the end of life. What would be the best native trees to plant now to support wildlife and grow to be this tall and last that long? I can, I already know a couple of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, so um, uh, whenever I- for an oak tree. Right, yeah. Frank? What's that? That's young for an oak tree. Seventy years yeah. isn't anywhere yeah. near its lifespan. So they should be. They should still go for a long time. I I think um, I would I would think so. I, I guess I would offer a practical tip here, as opposed to you know saying um, you know we need to plant this or that. The practical tip that I wanted to say is think grove. Don't don't think tree. Um, so a lot of people um, don't, you know, where I grew up on the South Shore of Long Island, in Massapequa, you know, a little quarter acre lot, people are scared of trees. Um, oh, it's going to hit my house, it's going to destroy things and whatever. But um, I think that happens, or I know that happens, because people are often planting what, what I call token trees, like the one tree in the middle of the yard, um, and they don't behave very well. So if you take that same species and put it into a forest, the canopy would be very small. Um, but because you're planting it in the middle of the sun, you know, the canopy gets very broad. Um, they don't invest a lot of, uh, of energy into growing out their roots. Um, and they have no friends next to them to graft to, um, to kind of buffer themselves from wind throw and other kinds of issues. Um, so those 70 year old trees that are, that, are probably, that are really just babies in terms of an oak tree, if they're really only 70 years old, um, I would plant a bunch of oak trees around them, beaches, things that commonly occur. Um, and the, the roots will actually graft together. Um, it'll, they'll be fighting for light somewhat. Um, so the, the canopies will be shrunk down and less subject to wind throw. Um, and ultimately those oak trees uh, will, you'll extend the life of those oak trees by planting um, around them and, and really helping to uh, give them friends. So think grove, don't think tree. That's my recommendation. Also where they planted, I have a feeling they may be street trees. Yep. And street trees, you know, oak trees to begin with really shouldn't be planted on the street. If you can plant them more, you know, in not the lawn, but closer to the middle where you can plant other trees around them. That little space, they don't have enough room to, to really grow their roots out and be healthy. Another thing is people tend to plant trees and plant it and forget it. You need to prune that tree, especially while it's young, so that it grows open and has a nice open crown and the wind blows through it. So you don't run into those issues where you have to worry, is my tree gonna fall down because it's windy today? Right, right, okay. Um, so I'm gonna take a final question from Taylor and Don because we're just about out of time. Uh, their question is, I'm very invested in incorporating more native plants in my lawn. 
what are the top ideas that you would suggest to mention in the elevator speech of selling this idea to someone else who may be contemplating this change? I think, Frank, uh, if you could start, I think this goes back to the Bay Friendly Yards program of what are the three essential elements of a, of a Bay Friendly Yard? Well, well, you know, I, 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 I'm, I definitely wanted to mention this at some point during the podcast or the, um, the talk, whatever this is, called, Zoom meeting. Um, <laughs> yards at savethegreatsouthbay.org. Um, we're offering pro bono um, consulting over the phone. So we're happy to kind of talk about your individual situation and, and, and offer some generic plant list to, for you to kind of uh, riff off of. Um, but, but I think the question was, how do you convince somebody that it, they should do it, right? I mean, um, and, and, it, and it really, it goes back to um, doing your part, um, however small of a part uh, you're, you're gonna, you know, there's, there's no piece that's too small to make a, a big difference. Um, and Native is beautiful and it will help save the Great South Bay. So that's, that's my point. And I, I'd love to hear um, the thoughts of, of the other panelists. I'll let Steve go first. Well, are they talking about what, how to landscape? Is that the? I think more how to convince somebody else that this is the 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 way forward. What that habitat, well, just, the habitat restoration is the way forward. Yeah, just doing our part because we we are losing so much. It's a, it's a good way to restore what we've lost over the years on Long Island. Mm -hmm. and uh, as far as native ecosystems and, and native plants. And to um, make sure that our native species continue into the future. Thank you. Steve. I'm gonna say the, the only thing that really you should focus on is just the benefits. There's the benefits far outweigh any negative anyone can come up with if you can even think of one. Um, whether it's the beautification of your, your your own home or your neighborhood, whether it's you know carbon sequestration, uh, stormwater infiltration, whatever it is, wildlife habitat, um, there's just the benefits far away. You know, no noise, no fumes from machinery having to maintain it once a week, no chemicals, no gasoline being spilled accidentally. Just there's just all these benefits. Just even just the enrichment of people just walking through the neighborhood and being able to just stop and take a breath and look at nature actually happening in front of them, which we don't see anymore. We just see artificial, artificially sustained landscapes. Mm -hmm. So there's just an enrichment. There's like a general generational amnesia that is happening where we are so disconnected that we don't even realize what we're missing. And when people mm -hmm. immerse themselves in it, they realize they were missing that part. People, people actually come specifically to my garden. They, they tell me, I come this way every day just to see your garden. I bring my wife by just so she can see your garden. So that's something that's missing. And I think that's something that you should consider. And that's something to, to help convince someone to, to make the jump and to convert part of their lawn to a native plant and do a baker in the yard because it's just the benefits far away any negative you can come up with. I think, um, I think here at Save the Great South Bay, we have a saying that says, start where you stand. And I think by starting with our own yards, we can lead by example and um, let the questions come from there. And it is a conversation. I like I like in uh, Bay Friendly Yards and uh, walking into a native planting situation to going into the wine shop where there's so many different varieties and it's really hard to know. So you just go always to the to that same label that you recognize. Uh, so I feel education is a really important part of an awareness of the awareness of the benefits and and just learning what what really is meant to be here. And we should plug Anthony's um, Facebook group, um, the Long Island Native Plant Gardening Group. I found to be a, a very incredible uh, resource. It's very active and people are just posting, hey, what's this? Is this good? What do you think about here? Yeah. Um, so it's a fun interactive community. Um, and again, yards at savethegreatsouthbay.org. We're happy to give some pro bono tips, okay? Thanks a lot. So thanks a lot, guys, for joining us today. And, um, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.